Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim I begin in the name of God of the God whose mercy is profound whose kindness is forever What I am trying to uh, clarify in uh, this series of um, uh, presentations is that the widespread understanding that Islam expects from its believers that the message of Islam should be spread across aggressively and if there need be people who are resisting should be fought against what i'm trying to clarify is that it's an allegation an allegation made against islam not just by non muslims but by many muslims as well but my point will not be clear unless i am able to uh present before you uh the quranic verses which let me say make this reality absolutely clear so that is what i am now going to make an attempt to do i hope some of you know but those of you others who do not know uh the quranic presentation the way we have with us today and the way it was presented to the entire world right from the beginning is a presentation which is not chronological in its order its sequence its order is different anything but chronological so what you have as an intellectual challenge is to understand as to why the quran the book of god has verses and chapters which were revealed in mecca followed by those revealed in medina followed by those revealed in mecca followed by those revealed in medina and it goes on so uh this is one of the many challenges that you confront while you are reading the quran as to why god chose to not make his book uh presented sequenced marshaled in a chronological chronological order this is not the session for me to answer that question in detail but the only thing i would want to mention right now is that one of the underlying wisdom that had now that has now been uh, clearly unfolded by some scholars in a convincing manner is that as the quran has mentioned itself the book of god is actually comprised of seven sura groups seven groups of suras chapters each chapter has been designed in a manner that it begins with one meccan sura or many and it ends with one madinan sura or many so the quran is a presentation of the almighty's message comprised of seven sura groups which are which begin with meccan suras which were revealed in mecca in the first 13 years of the prophetic mission and which end with madan suras suras which were revealed in the last 10 years of the prophetic mission after he migrated the reason why it has been done so is that each sura group has its own central theme its own system of of thought which has been sequenced in such a logical wise manner that the more you go deeper in understanding it the more you marvel at the uh, brilliance of presentation and that's what the idea is that you are attracted by the quran absorbed by it so much 
that you read it over and over again and uh, you tell yourself that I am getting more out of it and you never get bored. Right now, what I am trying to do is that I will present before you the second of these seven Sura groups. I am doing it because it will help me in my attempt to clarify before you the point that I am trying to make that the jihad of the Prophet, may God's mercy be on him, was meant for a particular purpose which was specific to his era and which cannot be generalized, universalized. This second surah group is comprised of four chapters. Uh, as I said, the first is Meccan, two surahs. Surah An'am is the sixth chapter. Surah Araf is the seventh chapter. Surah Anfal is the eighth. And Surah Toba is ninth. The first two are Meccan and the second two are Madanan. Just another by way of a passing remark, most of the majority of the Quranic surahs are also pairs, in pairs. So except for six surahs, 108 surahs of the Quran are divided into, are, are designed as 54 pair surahs. So in this surah group, the second surah group, the first two surahs, Surah Anam and Surah Araf form one pair and the next two surahs Anfal and Toba they form the second surah pair. Uh, if I was to use one word for describing each of these four surahs I would say that Surah Anam is a Surah of Invitation. Surah Araf is a Surah of Warning. Surah Anfal is a Surah of Preparation. And Surah Toba is a Surah of Punishment. If you ask me what exactly is the basic central theme of the entire Surah group, I will answer it by looking at the paper right before me in which I have written the translated version of my mentor Javed Ahmed Ramdi Saab's uh, uh, brief uh, mention of the theme of these four surahs put together forming a surah group. The theme is the establishment of conclusive evidence, itmam e hujja on the polities. Itmam Hujja is the, uh, the communication of the message of God to the people, to the addressees in a manner that there remains no excuse whatsoever for the people who have received it and who reject it. So all possibilities of excuse are removed. It is communicated so clearly so convincingly that uh, the uh, chance of somebody having a reason, a justifiable reason to say no, are, the chance is removed. So establishment of conclusive evidence on the polytheists of Mecca and the surroundings, cleansing and purification of believers, and God's final implementation of punishment. That's what this Surah group is all about. The manner it has been sequenced is this, that in the first surah, the Almighty is describing uh, in considerable detail the invitation that was extended to the polytheists of Mecca and its surroundings. They are being convinced that this message is from God. This is making sense. It is natural. This is the same message that was delivered by Abraham the great messenger prophet whom you also believe and take pride in claiming that you are his descendants. So believe in it. That's Surah Anam, the sixth chapter. The seventh chapter, Surah Araf, immediately following, 
is warning the people of Mecca and its surroundings that look here, if this message that has been delivered to you convincingly, if you're going to say no to it, then be ready for getting punished by being annihilated, removed from the face of this earth. Because this is what was the fate met by the earlier people who likewise were visited by the messengers of God. They said, they said no to their message and they were destroyed. Remember I mentioned in the earlier session uh, that in Surah Araab, the 7th chapter, there are stories after stories of the messengers of God who delivered the message to their respective people and they were punished. So that is Surah Araf. Then we have the Madanan Surahs. In the Madanan Surahs, the Almighty mentions the application of the principles that are described in the Meccan Surahs. So, if you ask me, uh, how could the difference between the two could be to mention? Well, one way of understanding it is that in, in the Meccan Surahs you've got the theory and in Madanan Surahs you've got the practice, application of the theory. So now that the people of Mecca were warned that this message having been delivered to you and you are saying no to it, be sure that you are going to be punished. In the first Madanan Surah, Surah Anfal, the Almighty is asking believers to get prepared to become the tools of the Almighty's, uh, Almighty's uh, project for punishing uh, the uh, polytheists, non-believers. So this surah is a surah of preparation. Preparing believers both morally, uh, spiritually as well as militarily. They are being urged to become befitting uh, parts, part of the, the scheme of the Almighty to inflict his, uh, his punishment on those who have rejected the message of God coming to them convincingly from his messenger. And Surah Tawba is a Surah of punishment. It describes the punishment of the Almighty that uh, uh, was sent to the people who rejected the last messenger of God. That's why not surprisingly it does not begin with Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Because in Bismillah Rahman Rahim, you are invoking the name of names of God which describe him as merciful, whose mercy has no limits, whose mercy is everlasting. So the message of punishment was inconsistent with the theme of the surah, and therefore the customary beginning of surahs, chapters, in this particular case, was not followed. So, if I tell you the mentions of, uh, I tell you the uh, titles or words for each surah again, Surah Anam invites, Surah Araf warns, Surah Anfal prepares, and Surah Tawbah mentions the punishment. Uh, this punishment was inflicted upon three different kinds of groups of people. The polytheists were punished by being killed, as indeed were the earlier people who were punished by being killed, in their cases through natural calamities, in this particular case through the swords of the companions. There were people who belonged to the category of the people of the book. They were not declared to be the ones who would deserve to be killed. They were allowed to survive, but their survival was under the condition that they will pay jizya uh, and they will remain as lesser people, second-rate citizens. This was also a punishment to a group of people who were living in the Arabian Peninsula who received the message of God through his messenger 
and who yet did not accept, accept and accepted, did not accept it and believe in it and therefore they were also considered uh, eligible and worthy of being punished. The third category of people who were punished were the hypocrites. The hypocrites were people who declared themselves as Muslims. So they were the most difficult of them all and therefore um, the largest uh, segment of the surah deals with their case because they are the ones who uh, are difficult to be identified. They mixed up with Muslims and therefore their treatment was done in a manner that the Almighty exposed them by requiring Muslims to go through different trials, trials which true believers went through successfully but the ones who did not have faith and commitment were not able to go through them. So, this is one way I can tell you that the Almighty's law of punishing the enemies of his messenger was described in the Quran. The second part of my description is uh, a mention of a particular passage in the Quran wherein the Almighty is mentioning that the messenger of God was forced to leave Mecca. He and his followers were uh, not just opposed, many of his followers were persecuted. He himself had to face uh, uh, different kinds of punish uh, kinds of uh, trials and tribulations through their hands. And uh, the end result was that life was made so difficult that the messenger had to ultimately leave Mecca and migrate to Medina. Uh, the Quran says, وَإِن كَادُوا لَيَسْتَفِزُّونَكَ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ They almost provoked you to expel, expel you from the land. From the land means the land of Mecca. لِيُخْرِجُوكَ مِنْهَا So that you leave this place. وَإِذَا لَا يَلْبَثُونَ خِلَافَكَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا In that case, they would not have lasted after you except for a brief period. This is reference to God's rule, his policy. Whenever a messenger of God who has delivered the message to his nation effectively shall be forced to leave the place where he delivered the message, no sooner shall he leave the place there will come the punishment of the Almighty. So when the Almighty referred to this uh, uh, migration towards uh, Medina, he mentioned that they are not going to survive for very long. And God Almighty mentions that this will happen because Sunnata man qad arsalna qablaka mir rusulina walan tajda li sunnatillahi tahwila This is because it is God's sunnah, it is God's rule, it's God's policy that he has always followed in the case of all messengers who came before you and you will find that God's policy never changes. You would never find, walan tajda li sunnatillahi tahwila, you will never find that God's policy, his rules would change. In other words, the Almighty is mentioning that if they are going to force you to leave this place, then they will have it. They're not going to be spared. Because this is what I have been doing in the case of all earlier messengers as well. When they forced their respective messengers to leave the land, uh, those people were punished by the Almighty one way or the other. Now, how did this punishment take place? in the case of the enemies of the last messenger, the Quran describes it. It describes it in Surah Anfal, the 8th chapter, and Surah Tawbah, the 9th chapter. I mentioned that the 8th chapter is a chapter of preparation. Invitation, warning, preparation, and punishment. But I am now saying that the 8th chapter describes a part of the punishment. The reason is that 
some part of the punishment was also a part of preparation for the punishment. You see, in Surah Anfal what you find is that the Almighty is describing some of the events that took place during the battle of Badr. The battle between believers of Medina and the polities of Mecca. It was a battle wherein a much smaller number of uh, Muslims, believers, uh, far less equipped, were able to overpower a much larger number of uh, polities of Mecca. There were 1,000 and there were 313. And yet, by the help of the Almighty, they were able to defeat them and inflict heavy losses upon them. Uh, the Quran mentions while describing it that you know when this battle was taking place in chapter 8 verse 17 the Almighty says Falam taftuluhum. You did not kill them. You did not kill them. Walakin Allah qatalam. Instead it was God who killed them. And there is an incident reported that the Prophet may God's mercy be on him picked a few pebbles and threw at the enemies. And it converted into a storm. So the Almighty mentioned this in this verse. Vama Ramaita is Ramaita. O oh, Prophet, you did not throw those pebbles when you threw them. Walakin Allah Rama. It was God who threw them. This is the description of the Almighty's punishment. You see, he is clarifying that you, you, you didn't kill them. You just did what God asked you to do. But I mentioned that it was still not a punishment, but preparation. Well, punishment most certainly it was. But it was a kind of punishment which was preparation as well. You know what? Uh, the society of Mecca, like most of the earlier societies, societies of the earlier days, well, probably the modern days are no different. It was dominated by some leaders who were so powerful that their influence would not allow the uh, ordinary people to dare to believe in a message which they were refusing to believe in and they were challenging that whoever is going to believe in it will have it. We will punish and persecute all such persons. So, what the Almighty did was that he removed all those leaders in the Battle of Badr. Seventy of them. Battle of Badr is prob probably the only battle in the history of mankind wherein all generals were killed and no ordinary soldier was killed. Why? Because it was the Almighty's uh, plan, his design, that the people who had become a barrier, a wall between ordinary commoners of Mecca and the message of God, they should be removed. And they were removed. And that was a preparation for the rest of the people to either believe or be likewise removed. So, in, uh, in Anfal also, wherein the Almighty mentions this uh, battle, he is saying that I did it. You didn't do it. But we move on. The next chapter, as I said, is the uh, chapter of uh, Tawbah or Barat. And it begins without the mention of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, uh, the merciful God who's Kindness is forever. It clarifies from the very beginning that these people, polytheists, they are not going to be spared anymore. Tell them that beyond the deadline of these sacred months, wherever they are going to be found, they will be killed. They have lost the right to live anymore. They were given the opportunity to believe they were provided with uh, evidences after evidences. They had the privilege of being the contemporary of the messenger of God. The word of God was revealed in their language. 
they were the people who more than anybody else could see that this text cannot be from anyone except God. And yet, they rejected it. And when the Almighty removed the leadership, that could be one reason why they could say no. And some of them still insisted that they are not going to believe. The Almighty then declared that beyond the de deadline of those sacred months, that is, the month of Zulhaj is a sacred month and beyond that is the month of Muharram, when these lapse, then they are going to be uh, eliminated. And the Almighty mentions it clearly in the 14th verse, the fact, قَاتِلُوهُمْ Fight against them. يُعَذِّبْهُمُ اللَّهُ بِأَيْدِيكُمْ God is going to inflict His punishment upon them through your hands. يُعَذِّبْهُمُ اللَّهُ بِأَيْدِيكُمْ God is going to give them azab through your hands. I ask people who say that, uh, where is it written that God punished them? through uh, the companions of the Prophet. Well, what can be clearer than this? God does not contradict himself by saying on the one hand that you cannot kill a single individual and then telling people that you go ahead and kill them. This was a special project. This was something which people didn't do on their own behest, on volition. It was not a part of the Sharia law. It was a specific project which could only be implemented when divine revelation was getting revealed from the heavens and it cannot be generalized this is what the Quran itself is clearly mentioning there is another mention in Surah Muhammad the 47th chapter verse 4 God is answering a question which obviously many many people would would ask but why 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 should these people kill? I mean, why not God do it himself? Well, he says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَنْ تَصَرَ مِنْهُمْ Had it been God's will, he could have taken revenge and punished them himself. وَلَاكِلْ لِيَبْلُوَ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا But he decided that he wanted some people to be tried, tested through others. God wanted some people to be punished and some others to be tested that they punish their own fellow nationals, their own tribesmen. This is the test, ultimate test of, uh, of faith that he required uh, believers to go through. Now, this is what the Quran is telling us. That yes, there are verses in the Quran which require believers to fight against non-believers and to kill them but these verses are the ones which were meant for the time when the Almighty was to inflict his punishment on the enemies and he chose the companions of his messenger to do the job and the Quran is very clear that this was an assignment given to them which cannot be generalized but imagine Imagine if, on the contrary, uh, people do not understand it and go on to do what they think the Quran is telling them to do as well, the end result is going to be that uh, people would always be ready to fight others. Those others who are to be invited and to be presented with God's message. You cannot blame others for not accepting his message. Except in case you have a certain information knowledge that those others are not accepting it despite knowing from inside clearly that is from God. Who is going to claim that? Who can do that? Nobody. Not even the prophets used to do it. It was only through divine revelation that the prophets would be informed that look here now they do not deserve any further relief and mercy so you we know that the prophet may God's mercy be on him was the most kind merciful forgiving person 
but the almighty asked him to not be kindly kindly inclined uh, towards these people because they do not deserve god's mercy anymore so for example the quran mentions in a passage ya ayyuhan nabi o prophet jahidil fukkufara wal munafiqin you fight against these non believers rejecters of the truth and these hypocrites that is don't continue with your policy with your attitude of kindness towards them anymore i god is saying i am telling you to now be firm against them because they don't deserve uh, your kindness anymore uh, there is a passage in the ninth chapter wherein the almighty wanted to expose the hypocrites by declaring that all able bodied men who have the resources to travel should leave everything aside and travel to a place tabuk which was hundreds of kilometers away from madina in scorching heat of the summers when uh, dates were about to be harvested and it was a test a trial of belief and god almighty decided it because he wanted to distinguish believers from hypocrites believers would have no problems in going for the journey because it was a privilege to follow the prophet and to follow the almighty's instructions and the hypocrites would in no way be go, be prepared to go because for them it didn't make sense why should they go uh, in an expedition and a journey involving so much of hardship so that was the almighty's scheme but it seems that the almighty did not communicate this scheme very clearly to the prophet to begin with and it so happened as some of those hypocrites came to the prophet and he being what he was kind forgiving merciful always he allowed them you know they came and said they presented with some excuse uh, could it be that we stay back uh, you know we have some some real, real problems there is some some something that needs to be done at home and so on my wife is not well or whatever and the prophet you know he said okay don't don't go the almighty in verse 43 of this chapter ninth chapter says afal la ho anka o prophet may may god forgive you lima zintalam why did you permit them hatta tabayyana laka until such time that it would become it should have become clear to you as to who are the people who are truthful and who are the ones who are liars so what i'm trying to say is that this chapter is mentioning the fact that these people are to be punished and for that purpose the almighty designed a scheme where in the three different categories of uh, the rejectors of truth were taken to task i just want to draw your attention to the fact that if the understanding that i am presenting before you which you have every right to reject <laughs> to criticize to question but if for instance imagine for a while that that is what god is saying that the verses that are talking about qital fighting against the enemy are the verses which were meant for a particular time and were meant to punish the enemies of the prophet which is what never happens other than outside the era of the messengers if imagine if it's true and there are people who are generalizing it uh and they are presenting before muslims believers verses like these and urging them to wage a war against the non muslims uh that is going to motivate them uh, move them and honest to god uh, god is the most effective in his presentations this verse 111 in surah tauba the ninth chapter says inna allaha ashtara min al mu'minina anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al janna god has bought purchased the souls and the wealth of believers in return for the paradise this is the starting point of the invitation that the almighty is extending to believers god has purchased bought the souls 
and the wealth of believers in return for the paradise. What do the believers do in turn? Yuqatiluna fi sabilillah. They fight in the way of God. Fayaktuluna wa yuqtalun. They kill and they get killed. That is what they are supposed to do. Badan alayhi haqqan fit tawrati wal injili wal quran. It is God's promise, binding promise on himself, mentioned in Torah, Torah, in Injil, Gospels, and in the Quran. وَمَنْ أَوْفَى بِعْدِهِ مِنَ اللَّهِ And who can be more firm in commitments, in, in fulfilling commitments than God? فَاسْتَبْشِرُوا بِبَيْكُمُ الَّذِي بَيَعْتُمْ بِهِ Rejoice uh, the commitment, the the uh, understanding that you had with your God وَزَالِكَ الْفَوْزُ azim, And this is a huge success. This is a big success. These are the kind of verses which the extremist Muslims are reciting before believers. And I tell you to do anything, you can't stop them. Because they are reading the Quran before them. And I and you or any any attempt to uh, incline them to peace would fail except for one, except for one. And you tell them confidently, convincingly that this verse is not addressing you. And if you are going to do it, you will fight against God. You will kill people for which you have got no justification whatsoever. And instead of the paradise that you think you are being promised, you might find yourself in the hell. And this is what I am saying is because if you read the Quran in the right manner and you read it as a book which is free from contradiction, there is no way that this verse and verses like these can be presented as urging believers to fight against the non-Muslims who have not even been properly presented God's message. I mean, are you comparing yourself with the messenger of God who delivered the message for 13 years and then for subsequent years in Medina with the Quran which was couched in a language, Arabic, that was the language of those people. The Arabs of today are not in a position to appreciate the Quran because as much as the people who were the contemporaries of the Prophet. Because the Quran, its language was designed, was couched in the classical Arabic. They were the ones who God declares at some point in the prophetic uh, era that they are the ones who do not deserve to live anymore. They have to be, they have to be punished. What is happening and I tell you, honestly I believe that this is the biggest tragedy of our times. The biggest tragedy. That these verses have been generalized and they have been presented by people, by Muslims, to fellow Muslims, to urge them to fight non-Muslims as a part of the package deal that God is offering them for them to sacrifice their funds and sacrifice their lives in return for the paradise. Nobody, nobody can defeat this rhetoric this narrative, unless there is a stronger narrative, more convincing presented and that is what uh, I am humbly attempting to do. Uh, honest to God, uh, we Muslims have got only three possibilities, three alternatives. Agree with uh, ISIS, Daesh, etc and join them. Because they are telling you that these verses are requiring you to fight the enemy. If you are convinced, go with them. Or accept what we are saying. If you are convinced, you understand this message and you let everybody know that this is what the truth about is. Or third, languish in hypocrisy. Close, shut your eyes and do what your desires tell you to do. Don't bother to look at your religion. Because these, I, I, you know, I have mentioned only one verse before you. There are verses of, after verses. Imagine the Quran is saying that if your love for your parents, your children, your relatives, your, uh, your nation, your homes, 
your business, etc. If your love is bigger, greater, stronger than the love for going in the way of God for jihad and get lost and wait for God's decision. This is what the Quran is saying. And this is what these people are telling uh, their listeners, those who are listening to them as if this is meant for them. How can we stop them? That is why, you see people are surprised that, you know, you go to the UK, UK and you find that Muslim parents, they are surprised that they, they, they sent their kids to the universities to study and they are picked by these people, extremists, and uh, they convince them and they, 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 they are lost in Syria somewhere. They just disappear. Why? Because these are strong verses. This is a very strong message. And if it hits somebody, well, he would go. You, you have no choice. And uh, as for others, if, you, if, if, if this message is, is, is making inroads into your minds and hearts, you've got to ask yourself, is it meant for me? Well, then I tell you, go to Turkey and then on way to Syria. Probably because there are no airlines taking you directly to Syria. Join them. But if that is not correct and what I am saying is correct, then understand this message and make it a point that while do everything else that you are doing which is not wrong, well, spread across this message. Or else the third choice I already mentioned to you, it's too embarrassing to be repeated. Thank you very much. Dr. Sahab, uh, the concept that Quran is divided into seven chapters, um, is it a widely accepted phenomenon among the Muslims? Uh, no, unfortunately, it is quite as unknown as the other concept that I am trying to uh, put across. Uh, however, you see, I, I keep telling people that there are some realities that are uh, by their nature such that uh, you need to look at them carefully. If you do, you will see them. If you don't, you won't see them. I give the example of uh, uh, the uh, crescent, uh, the moon that you see on the horizon, to uh, the moon that heralds the beginning of a new month. You know, uh, gone are the times when we used to go on the top of our homes to, to see the moon with our own naked eyes, because now it's in Pakistan, it's the Ruvite Halal Committee, headed by Munibur Rahman Saab, which declares it. But in the good old days, when we used to uh, make an attempt to look at the moon, uh, somebody would finally have a glimpse of it. And that somebody would scream and say, Oh, Ora, I have seen it. You know, got it. And would draw the attention of others and would say that, Look here, you know, you, you see that tree and that building, just see in the middle of it and concentrate. And when you do it, you say, oh God, got it, it's there. I, I didn't notice it, but it's there. And when you, when you have a look at it, it's a reality. Likewise, there are realities in the Quran, which I can tell you, you just uh, see and understand what we are trying to present claiming that the Quran has seven groups and you will inshallah very soon find that that's how indeed it is. You know, it has been marshaled in a manner that you find that the seven clear groups and they all have their own themes. Uh, but it's not very popular as yet. It's one of the many projects which uh, are waiting for uh, more efforts to be undertaken, mm -hmm. to be popularized. Um, I myself, I'm convinced. It's just that I think we have a... Um, uh, a generalized feeling that Arabs have more or better understanding than uh, the Indian or the subcontinent people. Um, so it's very hard, hard to convince them that this seven surah concept is there in the Quran. They say, ah, now the likes of Ibn Taymiyyah and people like that couldn't find it. Um, how is it possible now to discover this phenomena? It's like going by my analogy, you uh, see the moon. And you tell me, and I say, how can you see the moon? I mean, you know your age and you know mine. I mean, I'm more experienced than you. 
obviously you will tell me that sir just look at it have a look at it why on earth are you not having a look at it you know i'm just pointing you towards the direction just make an attempt so i don't understand i mean what we are telling people is that there is a clear uh, design in the ulama in, in 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 the quran wherein there are seven surah groups all that people have got to do is to look at what we are saying where is where does imam tamia come from <laughs> in this debate i mean he and they were great people we salute them for what they did but is it that god promised that imam tamia or imam ibn hanifa they are going to discover everything in religion this is no argument i mean you know by making these mentions people are actually saying that uh, we cannot be open minded we will always remain biased uh, just kindly tell them that the almighty in the quran mentions that those who are biased and not open minded uh, they will deprive of them themselves of the truth because truth demands a sacrifice which is to just uh, not allow any of your influences to uh, make you biased thank you uh, i have two questions uh, first of all for regarding this session uh, you mentioned that afrat mame hujja and the companions of holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave the azab to to the munafiqs and uh, on and the kuffars now are is that period includes the battle of jabal and hazrat uh, ali's uh, actions against khawaris and secondly how do you explain mohammed bin qasim's uh, uh, coming to send to uh, you know uh, inflict islam in, in in this part of the world uh, second question is from the last session uh, there is a verse of the quran wala nablu lakum shay min khauf wal ju'i wa naqsi min amwal wal anfus wa samarat and goes on now how do i know that if something good is happening to my life is it a blessing from a god and a gift from a god for my good deeds and is, if something is getting uh, if i'm getting something bad from a life how uh, uh, is it is it a punishment from the god thank you uh you know presenting uh, islam uh, expects us to by us i mean people like me to clarify many things one one of them is to clarify that the quran is the book of god fully preserved the book that has been declared as the ultimate criterion between right and wrong the book about which the almighty says in surah al baqara second chapter verse 213 that the book was revealed liyahkuma bayna an-nas fi makhtalafu fi so that it gives verdict decides amongst them in matters they de- disagree in now what were the circumstances that led to the battles of uh, jabal uh, and jamal and safin uh, i don't know probably i have a view but it's history uh the islam is not history historical events we will talk about them but there could be more than one opinions the quran is decisive the quran is clear uh to your question i might say that uh, muslims some of them committed certain mistakes and uh, they paid the penalty for it but not everybody was wrong many of them had a very correct attitude but the atmosphere was such that uh, you couldn't simply know what the truth was i keep telling people that even in today's world of information um uh, in pakistan we had an incident called uh, the lal masjid incident uh, you go to islamabad and you will find that there are as many versions of its story as there are people describing it why because you know when something happens and there are people who are asked to give reports people have different versions so likewise this history 
has uh, its own problems of description. But uh, the Almighty never promised that as a consequence of uh, the Quran getting revealed on believers, they will become angels. Now they will be humans. Even during the lifetime of the Prophet, the Quran mentions in the battle of Uhud, there were people who committed serious mistakes which caused them to actually be you know, punished in a way. Heavy losses were inflicted upon them and so on. So we will read history in the manner history is to be read and if possible we will try to understand uh, what happened in the light of the Quran but uh, it in no way uh, goes against uh, or contradicts the mentions of the Quran. Muhammad bin Qasim came to India for the reasons he or Hajjaj bin Yusuf or others know best. They were Muslims like us. What they did, we will try to understand uh, their decisions in the light of the Quran. I keep telling people that Islam is Quran. Islam is Sunnah. Islam is the authentic Hadith understood in the light of the Quran and Sunnah. Uh, and yes, the companions taken together were the ones who delivered the message to us. So as a community, when they collectively took decisions, that is also Islam. The rest is not Islam, but what has to be seen in the light of Islam to decide as to how much of it is Islam and how much of it is not. Apparently, we are told that he came to the subcontinent because there were some Muslims who were, um, you know, uh, manhandled and were robbed of uh, their funds, valuables by uh, these uh, robbers. Uh, but that, that may not be correct. There, must be, there might be something else that caused them to come to the subcontinent. But uh, we are not responsible for what people did in the earlier times. Uh, we are responsible to understand the Almighty's message and to see everything else that happened in the light of what the Almighty's message says. And I repeat that it is again a very important uh, project for Muslims to, to undertake to know what is Islam and what is not Islam and to distinguish between the two. I keep, I keep telling people to help them realize uh, how, how serious the problem is. To a common Muslim I tell you, and I'm not joking, the Quran is Islam. Hadith, Sahih is Islam. Hadith, weak is Islam. History books describing Sira is Islam. The statements of Imams and scholars is Islam. The incidents and stories of Sufia is Islam. The sermon of Malbi Sahib in the, at the pulpit in Juma prayers is Islam. The poetry of Allama Iqbal is Islam. What my great grandfather said is also Islam. People are so terribly confused. They don't have any way of distinguish one piece of information from the other even though the Quran keeps saying, repeating that this is the book which has come to distinguish between right and wrong, truth and untruth. So for God's sake, let's use that book and see in the light of that book everything else. Uh, you see the verse that you've referred to is a verse which talks about the fact that the Almighty has deci had decided that the companions will go through tribulations. And it says it strongly and emphatically. You and I, you see, I go through difficulties either because I have done something wrong or because God simply wants to try me. Uh, which of the two is relevant in my case? Well, I should do soul searching. I should think about my past. Maybe I have done something wrong and if I have done, I would, I would be reminded uh, if I if I ask myself uh, honestly, uh, but it, it's always going to be a question that I must continue to ask myself, did I do anything wrong to deserve what I'm getting? And if you're confident that you didn't, then probably it's just a trial for you to be elevated in the eyes of the Almighty. Just be patient and endure it. 
Yeah, uh, my question is like, um, uh, as you mentioned before, like the Quran has got like no contradictions. Uh, as uh, Allah mentioned, like uh, uh, Al-Nisa 4:82, He says, Allah says, like, do do they not ponder Al-Quran? Uh, it had been other than Allah, they would surely have it found much discrepancies and and contradictions. So it means like that's Allah already clear, like there's no contradiction in the Quran, and then. So in the one verse where Allah says, like, once you kill the one person, you kill the whole humanity. And then when you kill one, when you save the one person, you save the whole humanity. It means that Allah's message is there's no contradiction. So it means the verse, like you mentioned uh, later on, where Allah asking to the believers is not like uh, this is not a physical killing. I think this is more like psychological killing because like to killing psychological is much more harder than killing physical. So Allah, I think, asking the believers like to kill your psyche to get to the reward of the paradise, because we, when, once we're going like you know the um, um, like Maki or Madani, uh, well before Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam asked Allah Mia like um, God uh, in the words like where he says Rabb na ubas fihim Rasulum minhum yatlu alayhim ayate ka wajallu mumul kitaba wal hikmat wa zaki him inna kantar azizul hakim where Allah, Ibrahim alayhi salam ask Allah Mia like uh, like to send a prophet from these guys like and what he's what's he's going to be like you know um, uh, what he's going to do like he's going to read Quran and and give the wisdoms and other stuff so I reckon the Quran has got no contradiction I think that's the killing part is where all these jihadis and like uh, following right now I think the more a uh, God is mentioning a uh, killing the psychological killing not physical killing that's my question right uh, you see for one thing I think it's it, it's something good that uh, you have worried to uh, ensure that the Quranic message becomes free from contradictions so where you find an apparent contradiction you are attempting to remove it by suggesting an alternative translation to that extent i i do feel that it's 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 something that is to be appreciated however my submission is that uh, a text has to be understood in a manner that its meanings that you are getting out of it should be the ones that are clearly emerging from the expressions, words that have been used. Uh, we should not impose on the text a meaning that it is not accepting. The Quran is God's word that has come to guide us. And let's understand the way it is. If فَقْتُلُوا mushrikeen, You kill the polytheists. حَيْسُوا ثَقِفْتُمُوهُمْ Wherever you find them. Means kill them psychologically. Well then there has to be an evidence within the language to show that this is also a possible translation. My difficulty in accepting this translation is that in the same verses in the context you find that God Almighty is also saying surround them, uh, stay in ambush and pursue them in order for you to get hold of them and to kill them. Um, so the possibility that it is going to be a, it, it was a simply psychological killing uh, to me the text would have to be will have to be uh, completely deprived of the meanings which are very clearly emerging and the book itself claims that it's a clear book it's Wal Kitabil Mubin. It is a book that is not making statements which the words are not conveying. 
the book says that it's a decision of the Almighty. It's a, it's the criterion between right and wrong. If we continue to bring out from the text of the Quran meanings, which are not what the words actually mean, which are the famous meanings of those words, but we bring out from those words meanings which uh, we are inserting in, in the text to make it speak what we want it to speak, I think to me it really is not going to be the correct reading of the book. Uh, we know for example that Ibrahim salam, he was about to slaughter his son um, and he was replaced by a lamb which was ultimately slaughtered and that tradition has come down to us till today. Um, that physical slaughtering happening every year is a testimony that that slaughtering was not psychological. It was real physical. Uh, but then I, I encourage you to keep thinking about what we are saying. Like I would also like to give what you are saying a chance. But at the moment you know what keeps me from accepting your suggestion is that I will have to then look at uh, the various mentions of the word, word kill them and see if this word is used in Arabic language, in the classical Arabic language to mean psychological killing as well. Because obviously we are interpreting the Quran and the Quran should not be made to appear what it is not. But let's continue to worry and find out uh, what the Quran is actually saying and to that extent you know, I, I admire that uh, you are trying to resolve the apparent contradiction, but uh, I have already presented my understanding as to how it could be resolved. It was not something which humans did uh, as a part of the Sharia or law which was universal. It was a specific instruction given by God, like he tells his angels to take the life of humans. Angels are playing only the role of the agents of the Almighty. And they kill. But they don't kill. It is God who kills. Likewise, at the times when God's revelation was uh, coming down directly to the messengers, uh, sometimes what they would do would just be the instructions of the Almighty to do a certain task which was not a part of the Sharia. And uh, I can give you many other examples from within the Quran wherein what was mentioned in the Quran was clearly not meant for all Muslims. So let's keep thinking about it. But for the moment, you know, I, I feel more inclined to, to be comfortable with my uh, explanation. Um, so, if this is a slightly broader question, um, when we use the term extremist Muslims, isn't that slightly problematic because it sort of normalizes that concept? So, um, I mean, you're call we're asked to sort of consider it in a more nuanced approach. So then, do we sort of need to have a discussion around linguistics when we use that term as well? All right, I, I do concede that uh, some people can have a problem uh, in the use of this expression extremist uh, because uh, obviously, I mean, uh, somebody disagreeing with me uh, would categorize me also an extremist uh, because he or she thinks that the point of view that they are endorsing uh, is more moderate or, uh, or liberal and therefore these guys are being extremists. But my mention or reference to some Muslims as extremists was from my point of view. So you know, 
because what I'm saying is that this is the correct interpretation and therefore what the other person is saying is wrong and is extreme. Uh, but I do concede that, uh, you know, well, probably there could, be, could have been a better choice of words. But then is it not that sometimes um, some actions, some views uh, do sound and appear extreme uh, in the context of the general understanding, you know, uh, normally when you uh, deal with people, you find that uh, there is a you know, majority understanding which most people agree with, but then there are others who are talking about something which is taking you towards, uh, what is the other word other than extreme, you know, a completely distanced position from the uh, ground that has is ex acknowledged and accepted by the majority, but yeah, you know, it's 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 relative, and I I do see your point, and I'll think about uh, what alternative expressions I can come up with. Thank you. So just to understand um, Quran, how much of the Quran instills fear amongst people about the hellfire, and how much? Does it convey the glad tidings for the Jannah? And is it one approach more effective for some people and the other for the others? <laughs> you know, they, uh, I must have uh, read and heard about uh, this uh, relatively recent uh, claim of some scholar researcher who claims, and there are many others who repeat it, that so many times earth and as many times ocean, as many times men, as many times women and so on, you know. It's brilliant, I mean, uh, if that's true, it's, it really is remarkable, but believe me, I, I'm not particularly interested in these things, you know. I mean, uh, the Almighty is warning people of the dire consequences of hellfire, uh, not because God necessarily wants to scare people, but because God wants to warn some people of an imminent danger. People who are actually on the verge of falling into that ditch. The people who are the immediate addressees of the Quran. So if you ask me, and I mentioned it before, that what is one of the predominant themes of the Quran? And I'll tell you that it's, it's warning. Not because God is, uh, is uh, an angry God, God forbid. Uh, it's because God is kind, God is fair, but there are some people who have behaved in a way that they didn't deserve His kindness anymore. And they were on the verge of falling into the ditch of fire. And God's kindness required them to still be rescued from it. So it is appealing to them, warning them, telling them that, look here, it's going to happen. So, you know, many of those verses which are talking about uh, the fire of hell are the verses that have in their focus people who would actually become intransigent rejectors of truth. So, you know, sometimes you have to give a shock therapy, warning to people, not that it wasn't real. They are being warned of something that is real. And uh, there are people who are unmoved. Now, they, be, they, they might be very few in number. I don't know about statistics. But even if it was one person, you know, it was a good enough reason for the book to warn the person that, look here, what you are doing is going to cause immense damage to your future. So be careful. So, uh, I, you know, obviously the Almighty talks about the paradise as well, quite a, quite a lot. But uh, the Quran is actually also warning of serious dire consequences to the people 
who insist on doing what is wrong and are not prepared to to be inclined towards the truth so but but the numbers i've never counted assalamu alaikum i've got a question a brief one but uh, and allah knows best what i'm going to ask is why there are no women prophets in islam you know my understanding is that if you look at what prophets were required to do probably you will have the answer to it if you read surah nu the 70th surah of the quran it says that at the end of his prophetic mission uh nu alay salam noa he um prayed to the almighty and said oh god i preached them in all manners that were possible when they were alone when they were in public in the darkness of night in the light of the broad day i tried my best but i my my preaching had no impact on them now prophets are you know faced with circumstances which are very difficult they are sometimes ridiculed they are sometimes even tortured um, i mentioned that there are prophets who got killed if it was these possibilities alone uh, probably it would have been uh, not a problem for uh, women to also be uh, given the same privilege but i don't want to say it there are some other possibilities also which the almighty wanted women to be rescued from and not be put into that kind of uh, danger so i think i i do understand it's not at all lowering them in status it is actually a a, a reality of uh, some possibilities uh, which uh, the almighty never wanted to see happening and therefore they were not given that category well, they were they were all mothers of prophets you know they were but you know that particular job is uh, is full of some such dangers and possibilities that the almighty didn't want to put them in that's for my understanding ji yeah. um mera naam tarik hai mera sawal aaj ke topic se mutalliq hai ke jo aaj aapne farmaya hai kya koi aur bhi ulama hai almorid ke alawa jo isko subscribe karte hain kyunki pakistan mein jab hum baaki ulama ko sunte hain to wo is cheez ko describe zarur karte hain lekin badi sharmindagi ke sath wo kabhi isko unhone conviction ka darja nahi diya jiske wajah se wo एक्चुअली सब्सक्राइब शायद दूसरे नुक़ नज़र को करते हैं लेकिन इसके बारे में जब कोई वाक़ हो जाता है तो थोड़ी सी शर्मिंदगी के साथ इसको बयान करते हैं शुक्रिया मुझे इजाज़त दीजिए कि मैं अपनी टूटी फूटी अंग्रेज़ी में जवाब दूँ कम से कम एक बंदा हमारी बात नहीं समझ पाएगा आप तो समझ लेंगे मेरी बात आप यू सी वॉट वी आर ट्राइंग टू से आई वुड से इज a relatively clear presentation of the case of this point of view uh it's not that others are not saying it at all but the manner they are presenting their understanding uh which at times has uh, some part of our point of view uh included in their mentions but put together as you rightly pointed out it's not done confidently and it's not uh you know well presented consistent understanding which is coming from others for example i do remember that uh, i'm not too sure whether you heard of him i'm sure he's a famous uh, scholar maulana wahiduddin khan of india uh i i actually said to him uh why don't you say what for instance ghamdi sahab says with regard to these verses 
And uh, interestingly, in India, you know, when I met him, he said, well, I said it before he said it. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, following the same understanding. But again, you know, it's a, it's a bit surprising for me that such a big uh, discovery, to me, you know, it deserves to be mentioned and repeated over and over again so that it knocks at the doors of the hearts of Muslims that they understand that this is what the reality is. Uh, if you ask me, well, in the earlier period of Muslim scholarship as well, again, there are examples of uh, scholars who have mentioned this possibility, not very clearly, but uh, nonetheless, uh, there, there, there are traces, there are hints that people uh, did actually uh, look at this, this, this possibility. I'm give, give, giving you an example. You see, the classical understanding of this whole point of view is, theoretically speaking, that you go to any place and you just get rid of the uh, polytheists at least, which is what the Quran is literally saying. Now, <laughs> Muslims came, came to India and they found polytheists in huge numbers. Now, the consequence of uh, the implementation of the apparent mention in, of the Quranic verses would have actually resulted in a bloodbath. Literally, the entire land of the subcontinent would have been reddened with blood. Uh, thankfully, sanity prevailed and uh, scholars, they, they decided that, look here, would it not be better that we apply the fate of the people of the book instead of polytheists in this case. So, you know, they they move to the other possibility. But obviously this is no interpretation. This is actually trying to evade reality. I mean, if your God is telling you to kill polytheists, then kill no matter what the number is. I mean, what is this that you say that the number is so big now that it's going to be really very embarrassing that you kill such a large part of humanity. You see, when the consequences are such huge, immense and problematic, to me, it is, a, it is an indication from God. For God's sake, think about something else. This point of view is not correct. But the trouble is that there are many people who instead of looking for other alternative views, what they do is that, okay, let's, for the time being, let's solve this problem. And let's move ahead. If you allow me, i just give you... In Surah An-Nisa, the Almighty has mentioned his law of inheritance. Now, according to the understanding of many scholars, traditional scholars, in some cases, when a person dies and the property is to be distributed, if you follow the Quranic directive, according to their understanding, the numbers don't, don't complete, don't uh, make sense. Because, for example, uh, the widow will get one-eighth. Both parents would get one-sixth each. And daughters would get two-thirds. Two upon three plus one upon six plus one upon six is equal to one. The poor widow will be left with nothing to be given to her. So there is a mathematical error here. Now, it was... It, it is an indication to every person who is using his mind while reading it that either this mention is wrong and let's leave this book or our understanding is wrong and let's look for an alternative understanding. Instead what they went for, you know what? They said that let's proportionately reduce the denominator so that the end result is one. So what is this? But people somehow, somehow are satisfied. And some of them go as far as saying that this solution is a brilliance, you know, it is a reflection of brilliance of our scholars. 
because they have come up with a marvelous mathematical you know solution to the problem and what is the problem allow me to say god forbid that the quran committed a mathematical error and they corrected it so, i mean i i don't know i mean what kind of what kind of understanding is this so so you see let's not worry about what people are saying and what scholars are saying a majority as i said you know look at the moon that i am pointing your attention towards between the pole and the tree see if you can see it if it's there don't worry whether it's somebody else is watching it or not you have seen it so i am presenting before you a point of view and i am telling you these verses these verses these verses put together can you make get sense out of it is it making sense you say well it's making sense and i would say sir just don't look at the numbers don't look at who is following it to you the quran is saying something clearly because you know this is in itself a problem that people say that okay uh, sir what you are saying makes a lot of sense but how many others are saying that honestly my answer is i don't care i mean if nobody is saying it i can see it that the almighty is saying it and inshallah tomorrow people will start saying it if we start presenting it and inviting the attention of people people will start doing it and let me say it has already begun to happen the numbers are alhamdulillah increasing but i i i never believe in propaganda so i i will take this these words back and i will just say imagine that there is only one person saying it well how does it matter the truth is truth you know when gandhi sahab met his teacher mentor maulana amin as an islahi he said to him mr gandhi sir i want to become your student you know what his response was he said i have only one condition and that condition is that in pursuit of truth even if your shadow leaves you deserts you you continue pursuing it that's what the spirit should be if something is true it's true even if nobody else believes and accepts it because you've seen it 